This working? Hi. Well, hi everyone. Welcome to this year's filmmakers panel at the Long Island International Film Expo. Um, I think this year we have a, a great panel of different films uh, uh, of people to talk to about. And as someone noted, uh, there's something we can see a pattern here on the. <laughs> a pattern on the panel of uh, lots of, sorry, Deb, but, and uh, saying how wonderful that is, and uh, Anne's not here, but Deb is here, where we talked about that in the past, sometimes, you know, people had sent in their stories, and it's guy, 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 and this year it was just flooded with female filmmakers, and I think that's really awesome. Yeah. So to start with, I would just like each filmmaker to go down and just give the name of your film, when it screened, or if it, when it's going to screen, and a brief log line, one sentence log line of your, of your film. Uh, my name is Shara Umansky, and my film is Immunity. It's screening today at 1.30. And uh, it's a film about um, uh, if humanity can be eradicated. My name is Rosalie Gaffney. My film is On Point. It screens today at 11.30, and it's about a little girl who wants to be a ballerina, and the entire film was shot from the knees down. No faces, no dialogue, no sound, uh, no sound effects, only the music and the visuals. Yeah. My name is Sherry Berman. My film is a feature film called Sugar. It's about a woman over 50 who decides to follow her dream of being a rock and roll star, and it screens Wednesday night at 7.45, so come on up. Hi there, uh, my name is Cindy Crawford. Um, I'm here with the film Reset. It screens Monday at 7.45, and it's a sci-fi with a little bit of uh, time travel. It touches on bullying and race as well. Hi, my name is Don Shimei. I'm with the feature film The David Dance. Uh, we screened on Thursday. It's about a brother, sister, the brother is gay, and the sister asks the brother if he wants to adopt, help her uh, sort of be a father figure for this child that she's decided to adopt in Brazil. Very compelling log lines. That's really, that's really great. So I think I'll start with that then, so um, um, you know, I'm always as a filmmaker myself, and watching so many people go through it, I don't know if people understand the amount of time, energy, effort, money, just life that goes into trying to get a film made. Right? It's incredibly hard. So there has to be an idea that drives you to go through all that, right? So I'd like to each of you to discuss a little bit how you got to the point of making this film. What was it the, that idea that was inside your head that pushed you? to get from that thought to where we are on stage right now? Well, I don't think there's enough time in this panel. <laughs> um, this, this film, it takes place in 19, 1942 Auschwitz, and uh, a former school teacher arrives there, um, gets off the train, and is pulled off of the train from one of her former students, who is now a Nazi doctor. And uh, she thinks she's going to be saved, but it turns out his intentions are not honorable. Um, so I had this, this was a, a dream, nightmare that I had as a child, and it eventually became a, a story, and um, about nine, no, about, <coughs> about seven months ago, bless you, I, um, I just said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to make this happen, I'm going to keep talking about it, and talking about it, and talking about it to everybody that I meet, everyone that I see, until even I'm sick of hearing about it. And uh, I was a receptionist at a, at a mortgage bank, because I figured I could write while I'm not answering phones. And um, my boss called me into his office and asked where I saw myself in five years, and I just went off. I was like, I'm not really a receptionist, I'm a screenwriter, and blah, 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 blah. And about maybe 10, 15 minutes later, he goes, well, how much do you need to make, need to, need to make this? And I told him, and he said, let's do it. Wow. And can I just answer one thing? No, you can't have that person's phone number, so wow. don't. <laughs> <laughs> but keep talking. Just keep talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So for me, On Point started um, almost the beginning year of college for me. I had this idea 
of what it would be like to make a film. And just the first shot that popped into my head was the feet of this girl who wanted to be a ballerina. And my thought was, you know, maybe for like the first 30 seconds we only see her feet and then we end up seeing her face, there's dialogue. And I just kind of figured, well, what if we just didn't do that? Just made it 100% visual with no dialogue, no faces. And I ended up submitting it for a class as a screenplay project to possibly have it made into a class project. It didn't get enough votes from the class to end up being the class project, but the teacher did write in huge bold letters across it, please make this. And I just knew that I probably didn't have the time while in college to do it, but then I graduated May 2015. It was made August 2015. I just right away just needed it to get it, get it done, get it out of the way. So I was actually hired onto my film. It's a director for hire job. Um, I also edited the film, but it's amazing the way you get sucked in. Um, <laughs> and your life goes by, three years have gone by, and you're like, hey, I'm still working on this movie. Um, uh, what drew me to the film was simply the characters, because it is a film that shows women over 50 in a positive light, that their life is not over. <laughs> kind of nice as you start looking towards your future. Um, so I, one thing, you know, Hollywood films tend to be, you know, if you're, if you're, it's an older character, they're like the grandmother or the crazy old lady, which are fun characters and it's great, but it's nice to see these women doing things for themselves, things following their dreams at an older age. So that's really what drew me into it. And then once you get sucked in and you're working on something, suddenly, you know, like I said, it becomes, even though it's not your script initially, it becomes yours. So that's my story. Uh, will you John, to the rock and roll story? Because I know that's my weakness. I'll see any movie or watch any TV show that's about music like that, so I end up watching really bad shows sometimes because of that. Well, great. So then no matter how our film... <laughs> All right! Um, no, actually for me it was strictly about the characters. And, uh, and when we got Alice Ripley on board, who's the Tony Award winner from Next to Normal, that was of course huge. Um, and that's who I wanted. And it, it, it was just amazing, uh, that in of itself. So having her singing it, absolutely, I, I could watch those, those sections of the film forever. Um, but for me it was more just about these characters, that they were real people, and that, again, they had this life later in life. So. Um, what brought me on to uh, the film reset um, was the opportunity to work with Shooter Productions and the crew um, made up of Shooter Productions and um, I've worked with them before and truly when it's a pleasure to work with them because it's it's such a, a comfortable environment but at the same time a level of professionalism um, that you can see and feel and so like most projects, it turned into a passion project, and um, the dedication and commitment of every crew member and cast um, was evident, and it was just something that, that you were proud to be a part of. Um, and that's what drew me to the film, as well as to be um, invested in it. Um, the David Dance started as a play way back in 2003. I wrote it as a play, and um, people told me that I should adapt it into a screenplay, so that's what I did. I, uh, I had an ad everywhere for like a director because I knew I, 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 I act in the film, I produced it, I wrote it, uh, and I knew that I wanted somebody to monitor my work as an actor, that I wanted to bring forth my best work as an actor. So. I think I had even had an ad on Craigslist, but I finally, <laughs> I got like a lot of responses, but uh, I, uh, this one woman, her name is April Winnie, uh, who directed the film, she had sent me a film that she had uh, uh, directed, and then I sent her the script, and uh, immediately after reading the script, she said that she had cried, and so I, I knew that I had found the right, the right person for my film. But, um, so we began our collaborative process, but I guess uh, what kept, uh, the thing that kept me going was that as a gay man I always sort of struggled with self-esteem issues and um, this is sort of like a fictionalized account of um, like nothing in the film actually happened but it's sort of a, the issue is about self-esteem. So I, I often ask about um, funding the film and Sherry's story I think now <laughs> we, we should move into that because that was such a great story but um, the, 
we know what a commitment it is to make a film and how hard it is to, to pay for it sometimes. So I, I want to know if people could talk more about, more about how they funded the film. I guess you already did, so. Yeah, um, one more thing about uh, the funding. Actually, no, I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna just, uh, yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, Kickstarter. Kickstarter, Kickstarter, Kickstarter. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. We started yeah. with Indiegogo. Yeah. So that's a great question. So how a lot of people are doing that now, but there are so many projects on those sites and so few actually get to their goal. What do you do so that yours rises above to get to the level where you got funded? Uh, for me, it was all about keeping it small. I wasn't asking for you know a quarter million dollars. I was only asking for 2000 I took a look at what we really needed. We really needed ballet costumes. I really wanted my crew to be paid, and I really wanted everyone to be fed. I didn't need Tony actors. I didn't need you know a huge A-list name. I just wanted to make sure that my crew was safe. We had insurance, and that everyone was fed, and that no one was going to be grumpy on set. So um, by keeping it small, and also having the basis of working with the dance school, we got word out really fast. I mean, we had grandmothers, aunts, uncles of dancers who were possibly going to be extras who are donating. We had a huge support group from the dance company saying, you know, I want to work with, you know, Evolve Dance Company. I want to show my support for Evolve Dance Company where we got all of our dancers. So having a huge support group from the dance company really helped to get word out and then just keeping it small and simple and just saying we're only asking for $2,000 and also doing it on Kickstarter where if you, it's, you know, it's nothing or everything. So saying, you know, if we don't 100% fund, we're not getting any of this. And because we're only asking for essentials, the film can't be made. And that really put pressure on backers and people who are getting the word out to really make sure that we did reach our goal so that their kids could be in the movie and that they could actually see this project through. How many days was your shoot? It was three days. <laughs> so I can't really speak to the funding for Sugar because I'm not the producer uh, on the film, but I can talk about my first feature of my life as Abraham Lincoln, how I funded that, because it's a different way of doing it. I um, always say to students, I, I work with students, and I, I always say you should have a job that you can make money so that your work is in your hands and you're an artist. So for my first feature, I raised half, I saved half the money for, uh, it was a, $60,000 production, and I saved half that money over a few years while I was writing the script. Didn't go out, didn't have life, just saved money. And then um, I went to debt for $30,000, but if you set up your LLC correctly, you usually get about 25% back in taxes, plus there's tax breaks and stuff depending on where you're shooting. So you can actually then, I ended up only being about, only, you know, um, $15,000, $16,000 in debt in the end. And because I was editing my own film, I'm sure a lot of us are doing many things um, on our films because you have to. Um, then I just spent the next year and a half working and editing at night. And so I didn't really go out again, so I was able to pay off that debt and then move on to paying for um, sound design and marketing and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of really being realistic and whatever you think your budget is, assume it's gonna double, because it is. Um, and just plan it out, but you can, you can do your art yourself. You don't need a Tony Award person. I have to say our film is an under $200,000 feature. It's not, uh, our actors were great. Robert Klohess is in it, he's amazing. He's just an ama amazing person and Alice as well. They didn't ask for some exorbitant fee. I can't discuss their fees, but I trust me when I say it's not what you would think it would be. So they're out there, they wanna help indie filmmakers. Uh, I as well was not a part of the budget. I do know the budget. Um, it was raised by the writer, director, and editor himself um, that he saved and put aside. And um, it did go, of course, a little, you know, a bit over budget here and there during production. But um, something that is not really desired. But what did happen, and we hate to use the term passion project, but a lot of crew um, came on with their time, you know, um, just to be a part of the film, that's what they were taking away with it. We had the essentials, insurance, um, crafts, but um, a lot of it is is the support from, you know, your filmmakers around you that will come in and, and uh, work with you in hopes of the terms that they will work with you, you know, vice versa in the future, but that's a lot of ways how you, how you can do it is to get um, your filmmaker friends to come on and, and give you a helping hand. 
Um, we also had a pretty low budget. It was under two hundred thousand dollars. It was a SAG Indie low budget film, but we also got lucky. We got um, two grants. One was the Panavision New Filmmaker Program, where they basically they give you the camera, whatever they have in their stock that's not being used, and you use it for the duration of the shoot. And then we also got something from because my director was a woman. It was a woman in film, but it was through Chapman University, and they did a lot of our legal services as well. And so um, I was real, we were very lucky to get those two things. Um, and then for the rest of the money, I mean, it was a kind of a Kickstarter. It was like family and friends. And we're actually doing an Indiegogo campaign right now to uh, help with our theatrical release. But again, we didn't ask for a lot of money. We just did like what our basic is, you know, um, for what the things that we would need to help run that theatrical campaign. How many shooting days did you have with the Panavision camera? Uh, 21 days. Uh, I should also know that we were like four years in post-production. <laughs> uh, so because we did have, we, we did, you know, our, we went over budget and we didn't, you know, there were things that happened that, you know, it being, you know, my first uh, feature as a producer writer, you know, and also my director's second feature, you know, there were things that we ran into and we were like, oh, how do we fix this, you know, and there were, uh, we shot um, in Buffalo, and there's there's a scene where we need snowmen, and believe it or not, we didn't have enough snow <laughs> to do the snowmen so, in Buffalo. So um, uh, our our production designer came up with this idea: well, we'll use styrofoam, and then in post production, you have to paint over them. And so that like, became like an extra twenty five thousand dollars, which we just didn't have. So, so uh, we were four years in post production. <laughs> Yeah, if you're not getting snow in Buffalo, I mean. <laughs> um, all right, um, so a couple of people mentioned actors, so it's another question people ask a lot about is how to go about casting, and I, I think so, sometimes that, that devolves into a how did you get that name kind of question, but I mean it more broadly, like how did you approach getting actors to your film, the audition process, SAG, not SAG, how, go, just talk people through the decision-making process as far as casting the film goes. Well, I think this was a really unique situation that when I, I wrote the film, I had this this actress, her essence, her eyes, her look her, in my head from a film I saw her in 20 years earlier. And um, when I, I found the money to make it, I said, it was so serendipitous that I happened to get this money. Does anyone have, does anybody know anybody who knows anybody who might know her? And everyone's like, no. So, <laughs> so um, a friend of mine said, well, why don't you find out who represents her? So we did like all these Google searches, and we found out someone who used to represent her as a, um, a publicist. So this was just like, I call them meant to be moments in the film. And um, I wrote this beautiful email with an attachment of the script, how I wrote this with her in mind. If you could pass this along to her. And um, two hours later, I got an email back saying, I don't represent her anymore, but I'm gonna pass it along to her. So I was like, oh, that's nice for her to write back. I didn't really think she was gonna do it. Two hours later, I get an email back from the actor, Rena Sofer, saying, I just read the script. I, she, this woman no longer represents me, but thought it was, that it would be something I'm interested in, and I am. Um, can you give me a call on Sunday? This was Friday. On Sunday, I was like, yeah. So, 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 Sunday I called her, and she said she wanted to do it. She didn't, she didn't want to talk about money. She didn't want to talk about where or when she was on a soap opera. She's like, we'll, we'll work it out. And I just wanted to speak to the, the 40 and over. Um, both well, films um, that, I, that I wrote were for 45 and older women, and she was like, this is the part I've been waiting to play. So if you have actresses, act those roles in mind, and you're a writer, go for it. Go for the names, because chances are, if they're beautiful and they're talented, they've been looking for a breakout role, like Cher had in Mask, or um, Charlize Theron had in, in Monster. Like when I was pitching this to Rena, I said, this could be your monster. She's like, I know. So. <laughs> So yeah, and then, and then she did it, and that her fee turned out with her agent to be a substantial part of our budget, but well worth it. Wait, so how else did you cast around her? Did you have a casting director? Or, I mean, there are other parts in the film, I assume. Uh, it was, um, 
we had four roles, two major roles. Um, one was recommended by uh, our uh, cinematographer, and I met with him in a diner, and within a few minutes, it was, there was just that thing, and I was like, yeah, you're, you're the guy that I want. And he, I decided on him before I had the money to make the film. Um, the other two roles, um, one was uh, the woman who played her in the stage version because there was a stage version. And uh, the other one, also our, our uh, DP recommended this actor and our director was like, no, 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 no. And then he saw this guy and he said, yep, that's the look I want. That was it. I have a question. Well, I promise all questions at the end. That's okay, thanks. So it sounds like you had a cinematographer slash casting director. <laughs> yes. Yes. <Okay. laughs> yeah, sort of. And that's good. Okay. So I had a miracle worker on my side, and her name is Jen Vaz, the artistic director of Evolve Dance Company. If any of you are in the Chicago area and you need dancers, she is amazing and wonderful, bright human being. Please hire her. Um, she because it's shot from the knees down. Faces, acting abilities weren't really important to me. What I needed was an experienced point dancer. And that was the one thing that was holding me back the whole project through pre-production and early pre-production thinking, oh my god, how do I get an experienced point dancer who would want to do a film like this? So we had worked with the Evolve Dance Company for another company that I work with. And I asked my boss, I said, do you think Jen would be interested in this kind of film with the Evolve Dance Company? I don't know if she's got any point two dancers. And my boss, Lonnie Iski, said, yeah, we'll go ahead and, and ask her. And Lonnie happened to be in a meeting with Jen and just flew by the question, you know, hey, Jen, Rosie's got this project. Are you interested? And Jen said, yes, 100, absolutely. Yes, would love it. So that was, I'd say, at the end of January. I told Jen, you know, I'm just looking for a point two dancer and then someone who matches that point she dancer's skin tone to play her younger self would end up being the main character. Those were the one things, even though they would be wearing tights, um, I didn't know how skin tone was going to look and I didn't want someone to obviously say, like, you know, that person's Hispanic and this person is really pale white. Uh, they're not the same person. So we had a shoot February with the Evolve Dance Company and I happened to see Jen and said, hey Jen, have you, you know, any dancers that would be interested? And she said, yes, I already have them casted. Would you like to meet them? <laughs> so she introduced me to Michaela Johnson, who is our point shoe dancer. And then she introduced me to Sophie Campa, who ended up being our main actress. And they both had very even skin tones. They're both on the competition team, both with high awards in dancing. Um, I believe Michaela Johnson is a national champion at several of the dance competitions. Um, so Jen really, she casted everyone based on their dance experience from her company. And then she also hired, I'd say, 95% of our extras were also from her dance company. And it makes me not want to work with anyone who has not had dance experience as an extra because they were all 12 and under. And I was like, God, how am I going to corral a whole bunch of kid extras? But because they were on the competition team for Evolve, they were all used to knowing, you know, this is Mark A, this is Mark B, this is what you do between that time. Now we're just going to do this over and over and over again. And there were a bunch of 10-year-olds going, yeah, sure, I can do this again. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so Jen, we, we ended up giving her a choreographer slash casting director credit mm -hmm. since she hired almost everyone in that film. Um, and because it was feet down, when we had you know, adult roles like uh, the mom, the dad, teachers and stuff, I just hired friends and family because it wasn't that big of an issue. Like, you, know, you didn't have to have extraordinary acting abilities. You just need to be able to emote with your feet. So, but, but Jen was really the, she was the saving grace of this production when it came to, uh, when it came to casting, especially for our dancers, and I could not have been happier. They're amazing. I think I've been doing this more than 10 years now, and that's the first time anyone's ever said, just emote with your feet. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Pre-production for me was a lot of like, you know, trying to figure out animatics and storyboards, was a lot of me walking around my house and following family members, like if they were angry or sad. I was just like looking at their feet like, so how are you feeling today? <laughs> are you are you especially sad today? Your, your, your feet, uh, your feet show it. <laughs> your feet are sad. <laughs> and then trying to tell our actors on set, you know, okay, you're supposed to be sad in the scene. How do you think you're going to make your feet sad? Okay, we can, we can drag your feet, you can walk slower. Uh, but since they were dancers, they were used to that and they loved the idea and the concept. So it was, it came naturally to them. It was extraordinary, amazing. 
Uh, so Sugar was cast by Jennifer Peralta, a, a Jamian, who is a casting director in the city, and I see a smile over there. She's great. She's awesome. Um, and it was crazy because certainly getting the, the two leads was, you know, a challenge for a low-budget film, but um, we also needed a guitar player who was a great actor uh, to play the supporting character, um, the main supporting actor, and that was that was some, and really hard because we bring in these great guitarists like Debbie Davies came in. She's not an actor. I don't know if she is. She's a very well-known blues uh, musician. She's more of a studio. People know her as the studio musician, but she's been around forever. And she came in and she played, and it was like you're amazing. And then she went to talk, and she said, "Yeah, I'm not an actor." <laughs> she's actually in the film. We made a role for her, and that does happen a lot. We actually feature her performing. <laughs> because she was so excited about the project and what the project was about, but yes, yeah, she's not an actor, so it was definitely a challenge doing that, and the actor we cast, Catherine Danielle, actually sent in her, her original audition was, you know, digitally submitted, and she was playing the ukulele, because that's all she had, so she stood there playing the ukulele. She's like, my brother's a guitar player, he's going to teach me everything, so, but we had challenges like that um, throughout, but we, we ended up getting great people. If you have a good project and you're passionate and you go after the people who you think are going to be interested in that, they'll, they'll come out and work for you, but yeah. Sorry. It was a SAG project? Or? Yeah, so our, well, our film was a also low, ultra low budget, under $200,000 SAG film, which means you could cast both union and non-union actors, um, basically paying them the same basic rate, but they don't all have to be union. So that's what we did. Uh, we also had recommendations from uh, crew members, other cast members, recommending people to come in as well. It wasn't all done through Jen because we didn't have a huge budget for her to do every little role, but she did do a great job. Um, as assistant director, it was um, my responsibility to cast for the extras, and we needed about 15 to 20 child extras, and then about 15 to 25 adult extras. Um, and so how I did that was I just uh, put together um, two different ads and used Facebook. And um, we're from the Tampa area, that's where we filmed the film, and I live. But, um, and I'm in a part of about, I would say, eight to eleven different film-related uh, Facebook groups, and I would just post and post and post. And that's how we got all of our free extras, and they are more than eager and happy um, to come aboard. With principal casting, um, I know that they were looking with uh, local talent and going to the local um, acting studios and classes. Um, but when they could not find the, the just the right fit for the uh, lead actor, I know that they had to um, outreach and, and look out state, and, and that's how we found our lead actor from Alabama. But mostly local and social media. So was it a SAG project or no? It was not, no. Mm -hmm. Our casting director was Brett Goldstein in the city. Um, she cast our first, <laughs> our first, uh, our our initial six leads, and then um, there were smaller parts that were cast in Buffalo that me and my director did. Um, but I had uh, taken a workshop with Brett Goldstein, and I was just kind of like, "Will you read this?" And she was kind of like, "Yeah," you know. And so it was. Um, but I didn't go into it. I think with any like necessarily. That's not true. I mean, I did. I, I had ideas of people who I would like maybe in a, in a lead who I thought were more well known. But I was willing to give that up because being an unknown actor, I knew how important it was to to cast unknowns who were talented and working in the project as well. How do you just find people? Are you from Buffalo or? Uh, yes, I'm originally from Buffalo. I, I live in New York City. But, but how do you just go into a city and automatically <laughs> find actors? Uh, I think we had an ad in like the local paper, and then they would just come in. Thanks. Um, so I want to ask what more businessy type question is, and I'm always curious of this. And I ask this question in one way or another every year of the indie filmmakers. At what point in your process did you begin thinking about distribution? Hmm. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, um, right now we're making the, the rounds of the festival circuit. And what was recommended to me is not to even think about distribution yet, because while you're applying to different festivals, some of the festivals can be, um, uh, what, what are they called, uh, the festivals that, that, that uh, where you can be nominated for an Oscar? Um, oh, uh, yeah, the, the Oscar Thank you. Yeah. 
word escape me, um, qualifying festivals. So until your 18 month cycle of doing festivals is complete, um, it was recommended to me not to seek distribution. So I'm playing as a student film and I knew right away that the word student film might not appeal well to major you know distributors who would probably go for you know the full indie films and from the beginning I really didn't think about it as you know I, I would probably self distribute it might go up onto Vimeo um, thinking about possibly putting up you know for sale on Vimeo or making DVD copies um, for people who did not donate to the Kickstarter but were still friends and family of the dancers um, so I'd say probably like through production I was just thinking about you know how many DVD covers do I need to buy how much do I need to print how many do I need to to uh, make myself but it, it wasn't it's not one of those films that I feel you know needs to have you know a, you know, a distributor and and get out there it's probably going to go up onto Vimeo with all of its laurels that we've had so far so I can show it to other people and say you know hey I'm an accomplished director and this is what I've done and then use that as a basis for possibly other Kickstarters so that people can go and watch that film online and say, okay, so this is what you've done in the past. These are the awards that it's won and been nominated for. This is the festivals that you've been at. Yeah, I'm going to fund your next project, which probably you know would get a distributor because it would probably be a bigger out-of-school one that would not be attached to student film. So Sugar, they started to look for a distributor when we were in post. Um, some films do it earlier on, but to your point, it depends. Like, I think if you have a huge star and your million dollar budget, they have marketing and distribution on right at the beginning. But I think for an indie film, until you pick up some momentum, some festivals have distributors at the festivals, so you might meet somebody there. So right now, they're talking to a couple of distribution companies. They're holding off on anything because you don't know how you're going to do on the circuit. This is our premiere. Um, so we're waiting to see where we go before we pick a deal, I guess, but that's that's my understanding that they started when we were in post, started sending out just a few scenes to try to get some interest. And the thought of distribution, I'm sure, um, was in Dominic Smith's mind um, in pre-production, uh, but to the best of my understanding, um, the goal and idea was to create the film for film festivals and to get into the network and circulate and to build a little bit of a reputation, our name, um, and, and just be seen and try to get known. Um, we've So far, we've um, Reset has been accepted into five different festivals. It's won eight awards and 30, about 30 other submissions have um, been submitted in the past like, two weeks, I would say. So we're just trying to get in, in the circuit and get known. <coughs> Um, we've been on the film festival circuit for a while, <laughs> um, but um, uh, we were offered an offer from Wolf Video, which distributes a lot of uh, LGBT material. We It wasn't the offer that I really wanted, so I, w I knew when I created the film that I wanted to do theatrical, so I decided to do a theatrical release on my own. It's not something easy to do. You do need a bit of money, but like I said, we're raising that on Indiegogo, and... Um, yeah, I mean, I would say you definitely need to, like when you're creating the film or when you're in post-production, I think it's a good idea to have an idea of like where you want to go with that. I think doing like being on the film festival circuit, getting those awards, those things and help is particularly for a film, you know, that doesn't have like stars or really, really big names like that. You know, I think that's helpful. That's interesting. Talk a little bit about the self-distribution. So what does that mean exactly in 2016? Well, I mean, there are, you can uh, you can actually go, to, it's um, actually called, um, or, well, no, uh, there's uh, not for, for you can actually, if you just want to, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, I'm not really an expert on that. But if you want to do, like, DVD, and if you just want to do, like, what's streaming and stuff like that, I mean, you can go directly to iTunes and actually do it your, right. yourself. Right, but what is that theatrical self-distribution? Like, where, what kind of theaters would you be aiming for? Oh, New York, L.A. Um, it's actually through Rye Levy. There's there's no four-walling. It's, um, it's Rye Levy. He's a distributor. He actually is in Toronto, and he actually does the booking for so it's kind of like a distributor for hire. You're not really doing right. It yes. So that sounds way more doable. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, 
So um, so I've heard some people mention like the next projects and stuff. So I just uh, before we open up the floor for questions, I want to give everyone a chance to kind of talk about, promote, however you want to um, approach it, what your next project or projects are that you're trying to get off the ground. Well, <laughs> my uh, my next film is uh, Chosen. That was just, we just finished filming about a month ago, and that's uh, directed by Deborah Markowitz, and um, starring Kathy Moriarty. And uh, it's a short film, and uh, we're in editing right now, so that's real exciting. And uh, the film Immunity that's showing at 1.30. Um, we're looking for uh, an investor to make the full-length feature. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, <laughs> love that song. <laughs> um, so I'm a geography geek, and one of the projects that I really want to do and want to get off the ground is an educational show that I want to pitch to um, networks like PBS um, about a grandfather and a little boy who are able to travel anywhere in, the wo anywhere in the world using a magic map to teach kids geography. Because I just think that there's, you know, and teach culture just all around the world. Because, you know, some kids attach themselves to a culture and they suck it up like a sponge. And I know I was one of those kids when I started studying Japanese. Um, but I think if you introduce a whole bunch of cultures to really young kids, you can just, you know, you, you, they can learn so much and cling on to it for the rest of their life. And I have heard kids, like little six-year-olds, spout out knowledge about something that they've learned as if they were experts in that field. And that's just how they learn, how they absorb it. Um, so I really want to do that. We have a Japanese gardens near where I live, so I want to do kind of a pilot and ship that around to different networks and see if it can get some you know, some traction somewhere. So I have a few projects going on. I just finished a lookbook sizzle reel for a science fiction film called Numbers, which is up on my website, sherryberman.com. It's about, it's a futuristic world about uh, a woman who, it's a, sorry, let me start that again. It's a world where people have numbers instead of names. So, and the woman in the world discovers that she's not just another number, that she's a very important individual in the world. So that's one project that's a very high budget that's being pitched around by my manager. Um, I also have uh, an experimental film I'm editing right now. I shot on Super 8 <coughs> called Woman. So that's going on, and I'm also trying to write a script called Broken about a teenager who loses her lower leg in a car accident and has to live with her grandmother, ends up living with her grandmother, and is haunted by a child from the Holocaust, and she learns to have faith again. So, um, and that, that would be a lower budget that I can maybe afford to do. So that's what I'm doing. Um, so Reset was made um, in the mindset that uh, we had big ideas and goals for it and um, we're out playing them now. And uh, so what's on the horizon is to continue to um, go on the fun track that Reset is playing out, um, as well as Dominic Smith is writing three different features, uh, three different genres, and by 2017 we'd like to accumulate um, some investors, um, et cetera, and have one picked up off the ground to shoot early 2017. I have a feature script that I'm pitching around. It's called The Harp Sisters. It's about a gay man and a black woman who are roommates and they're sort of struggling artists in New York. It's actually a comedy. I knew I wanted to do something less. <laughs> it doesn't sound like one. Um, uh, I knew I wanted to do something less serious. <laughs> Uh, after I had done this one, um, and so that's it. Great. Okay, so I'd like to open the floor for questions for the filmmakers. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that the actress on the group was. Are you, is that a feature film or a short? Sure. Short. Sure. Okay. And you mentioned that she took the larger part of the budget. Not the larger part of the budget, but a, a good part of the budget went to... Okay, I just have a question. I'm kind of a businessman, and he was a very motivated actress. Why couldn't we negotiate something a little better with her? She really wanted to do this thing. Well, maybe she has an that. agent, <laughs> and she she's a very prominent actress on a currently on a soap opera, internationally very well known, has done a bunch of 
TV, she played Jack Bauer's wife on 24. She was in Keeping the Faith with, I mean, she's just done a whole whole bunch of stuff. And um, I, I can't divulge the budget. Yeah. Um, but, and I, I didn't want to give the, uh, the impression that it was most of the budget. I'd say that it was maybe, um, 10% of the budget? From a business point of view, to put it this way, as supply and demand, the supply of name actors who could help you get distribution is really, really small, and the demand for those actors is really, really big. So even in a motivated situation like this, it's, um, I think most people on the panel, the takeaway isn't that somehow Sherry had Rena Sofer over a barrel because she had this great role, it's actually the opposite. It's like it's really, it's amazing when someone of that caliber will become interested in a low budget indie short film. So, especially thank you, and especially yeah. from I, I haven't had any uh, award winning films before. I'm a new writer. Um, my, it was my first opportunity uh, to be a, a co producer. So, the fact that she even read the email was huge for me. And her agent wouldn't have let her if it had gone through those channels. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. If, if the email went went to her agent, there, he wouldn't have even looked at it. He didn't want her to do it. Is there any, I know with feature films today with older actors, they sometimes will take back in deals, small amounts of time. Does that at all exist in the short film world? I don't know. Short films generally don't make money, right? They're calling cards for either a future version or for future projects or something like that. Right, and what's more, she has a right to first refusal at the role when it becomes a feature. Yeah. For both names. For both of us, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, to whatever degree you're comfortable discussing it, I'm curious um, if you are full-time filmmakers now, um, and if so, or if not, what your life is like right now, and a bit about what your journey was like to get to where you are now, wherever you are now. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I'm not a full-time filmmaker, but my boss, who was my investor, has since become my partner and an LLC, and we've made our second film and are now planning on, a, on making our third. And uh, my journey here was, uh, I guess it was a little different. I was an actress first, and, and then a, a wife, and then a mother, and then uh, I turned 40 and said, you know what, I want a life. I want a life for me. Yeah. And, um, Immunity was born. It became. Uh, I wrote it first as a um, as a play, and it won the Venus Theater Festival in New York City. And then it had a sold out run at the Manhattan Repertory Theater Company. And people said this should make this should be made into a film, and, and it was. So I'm be pretty much just out of film school. I was really really fortunate to be able to get. Um, a well-paying part-time job at Vixen Productions um, while I was in school and then continued that job out of school. It's not full-time, um, but I'm not doing filmmaking. I'm studying to become a Pilates instructor because, uh, you know, generally that's a little bit more of a solid job and I also know that that's a job that I can have the flexibility if I have a shoot, I can cancel a class, I can move my schedule around. It's not like working a nine-to-five where someone else is saying, well, now you need to come in today and then having to tell them, well, you know, I've, I've got a shoot today, and uh, we do weddings at the company that I work for. So sometimes some months are busier than others. So that's why I chose it as kind of like a not a career, but as a second job, because that was something that I had control over while still making some decent money. Um, ever since I was really young, I really wanted to become a filmmaker, and that's what I knew I wanted to do. Uh, so much so that I went to uh, Tribeca Flashpoint when I was 15 years old for a boot camp. And when they told me, well, you can come back and attend college at 18, I went home and I cried. Because I was like, no, I want to make films now. So my mom and my dad were like, okay, okay, we'll find you a school. Um, and I ended up going to a smaller community college that had a really wonderful film program. And I started that when I was 16. Um, so it was just like my drive, like, you know, I want to make films, I want to make films. I'm not going to do anything else but films. Um, thank you. <laughs> 
So that really, really helps, you know, get me into the industry and keep that passion going. Um, I've also been very fortunate to be able to go to workshops now that I am out of school. And since I go... And people say, well, you're only 20, you're not like an experienced director or an experienced camera assistant because a lot of your counterparts are still in film school, so we're not going to take you that 100% seriously. So then, making my own opportunities and making my own films. <laughs> so I work, um, I have, when I first were starting making films, I would work a job and then I'd quit the job to make my film, and I get another job, and quit that job, and so on. Um, now, I happen to be very fortunate that I have a job that um, gives me a full-time, I, I work for a company, I have a full-time position with benefits, but I only have to be in the office three days a week. I have a very flexible schedule because of the kind of work I do. I do communications and videos for this company, so I'm still doing industry-related stuff, but it's certainly not narrative film. Um, so. By having that, I was able to just take time off to do sugar, and I could edit, and I could work that job so that I don't have to worry about the money coming in, because even though sugar paid me, it's an indie film, so the pay is like an honorary pay. It's not a Hollywood paycheck, and that's fine. For me, it's more, I mean, obviously we all want the dream job, and I'm going to get paid, you know, ten hundred million thousand billions of dollars to make films, but that's not the reality in the world, especially for women, right? 51% of the population, 4% of the directors of Hollywood are women. So um, that was the last poll I read. I might be a little off there, but not far. Um, so because of that, to me, you have to, especially as a woman, you have to have a way you can make your money and make your films because the more we all keep making our films and funding ourselves or getting jobs like this that at least you're not going into the hole and you're part of a project you care about, you can move forward. I'm a member of Film Fatales, which is a group of women directors. We're very supportive of each other. I'm also an editor, so once in a while I'll jump on and edit somebody's smaller project for free but to help them get going. Um, and then everybody does that. People help each other out like they can. And I think, <coughs> including for men, I'm, I'm married to a male independent filmmaker. It's hard for them as well. So it's good to help out. Everybody has to help each other so we can keep moving forward and doing interesting work. So that's my philosophy. Um, so I've been pursuing film for about two years. Um, I am self-taught, so without any formal training. Um, and I did that on the weekends because um, I did work a, a nine to five, um, and I networked my way from one film to another, gaining experience and learning. Um, and now I am a business owner, and so that does give me a little bit more flexibility to take time off to work full time on a film, um, but finding that balance between where it's only business, as Safe Touch Auto Glass is the name, or or filmmaker and because both require 100% of time, but um, yeah, you weekends, nights, or you find a flexible job where you're able to take off, or you don't have to work five days out of the week, or what have you, but um, that's where I'm at as well. I have a flexible job, <laughs> and um, you know, I do, I feel like I'm doing a lot of producerly things right now, and so that's, um, I'm doing a lot of promoting of the film, you know. That's it. <laughs> Other questions before we wrap up? I have one more thing. I love your dress. The fruit. Yeah, I know. I love it for my head, tomatoes. <laughs> is it hot pot? Yes. Hot pot, yeah. I happen to think everyone is dressed very nicely. <laughs> some of you have touched on some of the obstacles you had to face, but are there any other um, hurdles you had to address? Some of the biggest ones, anything I think um, something that isn't really spoken about too often is when there are personality conflicts 
on the set. Everybody has the best intentions, and everybody wants to make the best film. Um, for example, if a director and an actor have different um, methods, personalities, um, communication, different ways that they communicate, um, that can be uh, destructive, disruptive, um, and make everyone really uncomfortable. So um, one thing that I would recommend as a filmmaker is, and especially with independent film and when you have a very short amount of time to film, um, take at least a day, at least a day, or half a day, <laughs> or to get together, to talk about, don't just go right into rehearsal, because there was one particular experience where we went right into rehearsal, and the actor cut off the director's head and said, don't talk to me like that. I, I don't appreciate that. You know, give me a chance to finish my sentence or finish the scene before you, before you cut my head off. So just the opportunity to get to know each other a little bit before you start. Um, and even for crew members who might be coming from different areas of, of the state, of the country, just to get together to do like a little chemistry check um, is invaluable. So for On Point, since it was shot from the knees down, a lot of our difficulty on set had to do with costumes. How do we tell one character apart from the other? So uh, we set color scheme for each character or groups of characters, like all the ballet judges all wear earth tones and browns. Our mom in the scene only wears purples, dad wears black. Sorry, dad wore navy blue, teacher wore black, main character wore pink, our point two dancer wore white. And I think the biggest complication we had was with Michaela Johnson, our point dancer, was with her uh, skirt that we made, her tutu. I took a look at some tutus online, and most of the classical ballets that we see have pancake tutus, where they go straight up. The problem with that is that when you have pancake tutu that high, you don't see it from the knees down. So how do we distinguish that our point shoe dancer is in a performance versus just a rehearsal besides some, you know, a clap track at the end of it? So what we ended up doing was we ended up making a very long romantic uh, style tutu that went down to about her, a little bit past her calf. Um, and that was a beast of itself. It was 14 yards of glittery tulle. Um, and our costumer, Janet Ellicamp, we had it like stretched from one end of the costume shop to the other just to hold it up to pin it and like just rotate around the mannequin to get the full puffiness. And about that time, we realized that the glitter did not stick to the tulle very well. And we were sweeping up that costume shop for days. There was glitter everywhere. And then we got on set and realized that we hadn't shaken off any of the loose glitter. So between takes, we were just sweeping glitter off the ground. It's on equipment. It's on crew members. We're finding it on ourselves for like three days past production. We were doing like official glitter checks on all of our other actors' like costumes before they went on uh, for the scene. Because, you know, not all the scenes were with the point shoe dancers. So it would make sense that they have, like, their shoes are covered in glitter. So our costume is just, like, on her knees with, you know, makeup brushes sweeping glitter off of everyone's shoes and pants. Um, and it ended up being a hilarious memory when I was getting texts from the crew members saying, you know, I'm still finding glitter on myself, Rose. I'm still finding glitter on this. Um, but when we ended up seeing the final result under the lights, I could not have asked for a better tutu, and we're so glad that we went with the longer style and that as much of a pain as the glitter can be, it just ended up looking gorgeous under the lights. It was perfect. When you came in today and were thinking of obstacles to filmmakers, you weren't thinking one of the answers would be glitter. <laughs> Purpose of the crack world. So we definitely had some personality things happen. Uh, there was a day where hair and makeup had to be, I mean, hair, makeup, and costuming had to be separated. Um, the mistake there, I will say for anybody who wants a little advice, is make sure each department has a head to it. You know, like your camera department's the DP, it's, some of them are very obvious, but uh, makeup and costume on an indie set is it's such a small group, somebody needs to be told, you know, they're in charge, so they have a final say. That was the mistake there. Um, but our horror story, because you had asked for a horror story, I wore my Goonies Never Say Die shirt, because I think it reflects indie filmmaking. Yeah. To a T, I wear it a lot on set. Um, 
we had a day, you know, when you're on an indie film and you're trying to keep your money tight, we made a music film for under $200,000. It's crazy, okay? So we begged, borrowed, and stole, and we got a space in Harlem at a bar, and the woman who signed the contract gave it to a very cheap rate. We were amazed. The first day on set, on that, on that set, we were supposed to be there six days, um, which was about a third of our shoot, and the business owner came in after we had loaded in, and we were shooting about half the day in, and told us we had to leave. And our producer had a total meltdown. She tried everything, begging, crying, pleading, and he was like, I didn't sign the contract, and apparently the woman who did got some huge tax break off of it of like $30,000, and like she kind of did the wrong thing. We weren't aware, obviously, what we know. Um, so he was just going to kick us out. He sat down at the bar, wouldn't move, and one of our actors, Catherine Danielle, starts sweeping, and I, I'm like, well, people are stressed. They do weird things. I don't know, man. But she starts sweeping her way over to the business owner, and it was a, such a smart thing to do because she's showing we're taking care of your space. She's making her way to him slowly. She starts talking to him about the film, and how our budget is not that big and how much it means to us and then I kind of walk by and she accidentally I walk by and she says Sherry why don't you come here and we have a discussion and I think in the end it was us showing our side of what we needed and how we didn't have a lot of money and we weren't out to get him or steal from him and to also listen to him so to get him to hear our side and us to hear his side, and in the end, instead of charging us $30,000, he charged us $3,000, which is amazing, because everybody worked together, and I think that's true in life. Everybody has to listen to each other, so that's an important thing, to keep calm and not get mad, and just listen. Um, so I was going to say um, the point that you made in the new as well. It is uh, personality conflicts on set is something that is not usually spoken about, or you, you say it's the elements of weather, um, time, camera cards, equipment is um, are hurdles that um, are common, but that is very uh, real and, and it's not spoken about. So um, I think having trial runs or doing short, like maybe a small web series or a small, just a tiny short film before you commit to um, hiring cast and crew for a feature length film. Um, we, that's it's just wise to do to have that chemistry uh, between the crew um, and the cast and crew. So, but that is definitely an area that's not spoken of, but it is real, and you need to be prepared uh, by having a strong crew around you. We actually, he, uh, he had signed a contract and everything, and we, everything seemed fine, but then I think when he saw how much stuff, even though that we were taking very good care of his space, he probably thought that we were a little student film, and when he saw trucks and things in his driveway, it was, and, you know. Um, even though that we had talked about it with him, about that, all that stuff that was going to happen several times, we had several meetings before explaining him to him what was going to happen and everything, he just, I think he just kind of freaked out. So we, fortunately, my UPM, my unit production manager, she lived in the area and she had another space, so um, it's helpful to either have people who live in the area or who know people or, uh, you know, just everybody pitching in to make it work at the end. While we're out of time, thank you so much for coming. I would urge you to stay uh, at 12.15. We have a screenwriting um, presentation uh, panel. <coughs> Excuse me. We have Lauren Paul Kaplan, who's a writer and uh, screenwriting professor and lots of other cool stuff. So come at 12, 12.15, and thank you so much. And go see the films that haven't been shown yet here. Thank they sound you. really great. Thank you.